Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the international best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. And just a reminder, my home base is wedontdie.com, where you can always find our free Sunday gathering with medium demonstration, join our community, take a class, and so much more. And I've been celebrating, I have to be honest. I don't like to toot my own horn, but my second show, Shades of the Afterlife, it just recently became the number one top downloaded afterlife podcast in the world. And I have our friends at Coast to Coast AM, George Norrie and Tom Danheiser, to thank for that as they share it a lot. There you find over 175 episodes that I'm a reporter in on the afterlife. There are some clips from episodes with great guests, but here on We Don't Die Radio, it's one-on-one with a special guest as we have today. You can easily find Shades of the Afterlife wherever you find your podcasts. Just type in Shades of the Afterlife. Our guest today is Dr. Matthew McKay, a professor at the Wright University in Berkeley, California, who is the author or co-author of more than 25 psychology, self-help, and therapist texts. Over the years, Dr. McKay has taught a wide range of classes at the graduate level, ranging from cognitive and psychodynamic psychotherapy to systems and brief therapy courses, and specializes in the cognitive behavioral treatment of anxiety and depression. Dr. McKay is also a father, and after the violent death of his son, he went on an exploration and discovered a technique that works in communicating with his son. He is the author of the book, Seeking Jordan, How I Learned the Truth About Death in the Invisible Universe. Dr. Matt McKay, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. I'm glad to be with you, Sandra. Super glad to have you here. And I know you're a dad and you've been through a lot, so certainly condolences there. But from what I know about you and what our mutual friends have shared about you, that journey has really helped other people believe not only in the afterlife, but in ways to connect. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself and Jordan and go back and what had happened with him? Yeah. So it's more than 15 years now since Jordan died. He was on his way home from work on his bicycle and men attacked him probably to try to steal a bike. Eventually, after a tremendous physical battle, they shot him and he died on the street. As anyone can imagine, and that's the worst thing that can happen, is losing your child. At that moment, or very shortly afterwards, I think that the two things that mattered most to me, and I think this may be true for a lot of parents, or, or anyone who loses a loved one, is does that soul, soul still exist? And are they okay? Are they in a place where they feel good? And I was just consumed with that question. And so I did start looking for Jordan, started seeking him in different ways. And we went to mediums and got some sense of something he was saying through them. And yet, while there was some sense of him, some reassurance he might still exist, it wasn't anything that really warmed our hearts. And so we began looking in other ways. We sought out Alan Botkin, who discovered accidentally something he calls induced death after death communication, went to Chicago to meet with him. It's a technique that comes from uh, EMDR, eye movement desensitization reprocessing, which is something that we use to help treat trauma. I've used it with hundreds of clients over the years. But in this case, we were going to see him and he was going to use his variation of that with us. During that experience, I had my first direct contact with Jordan. I could hear his voice very clearly. And it was not inside my head. It was a voice that was coming from outside of me. It was his voice. And he was telling me the very things that I needed to know, that he was he still existed. He, In fact, he's watching over us. He was observing our lives. He was connected to us. And he was good. And he, he, he was happy where he was. So this was a first major step for me, for us, uh, my wife and I, to begin to connect to him again and to and to reestablish the relationship through the curtain to the other side. So that was important. Also, 
before this, I had read a lot of Michael Newton's work on the journey of souls and so forth. And I had learned, because I'm a psychotherapist and I'm a good hypnotist, and I'd learned his particular method of regressing people to their past lives and then from there bouncing into the life between lives and having them observe the life between lives. And I had done that with quite a few people. I didn't do, I didn't charge them, but I did it. If anybody who wanted it and needed it, I would do it. And I got to observe their experience, but I never got to have it. And so somewhere along this point in time, I got involved with Ralph Messner, who was a the late Ralph Messer was a specialist in the afterlife and after death communication. He did that same process. He induced me into a past life and then the life between lives. And I could make contact with Jordan in that way and confirming that souls reincarnate together and often in very different relationships to each other in, in each particular life. They often have very different ways of connecting. But the but the problem still was that I, it was all one way. I was with Alan Botkin's process. I was just hearing Jordan passively with mediums. I was hearing their representation of what Jordan was saying. And even in this hypnotic process with Ralph, it was a passive process. I was experiencing things, but I was not able to participate in the communication. So finally, Ralph taught me how to do channeled communication. And it didn't take them very long. It was actually a fairly simple process. And I tell your audience how to do it if they would be interested. But in less than an hour, he taught me how to do it. Probably much less than an hour. I went home that night and I had my first experience of a conversation with Jordan. A conversation in which I could ask questions. He could answer them. I could respond. He could respond to whatever I was saying. And it felt like we'd gone back to those beautiful days around the kitchen table where we could talk about anything and had these long, beautiful, and sometimes, sometimes it seems like endless conversations. And I had my first experience of being able to have that again. And it greatly shifted the grief from just from the grief of having lost him to I've lost his physical presence, but the relationship and the love is still completely there, completely intact, completely alive. And so that was an enormous transformation for me. And to still have Jordan in my life and to have that has made all the difference in terms of facing this loss, but also in terms of learning. I've learned so much from him and that's made a big difference. I've, I have a completely different understanding or cosmology of how the universe works as, as a result of his communications. Before we end our chat today. We'd love to know those steps, but I'd like to find a little bit more about some of the things that Jordan talked to you about. And in the beginning, a father knows his love. I'm a girl. I know my dad's love. No one can convince me that some of the things I've experienced were just my imagination. You feel his presence as you write. You like the question. I feel his love. <laughs> if I could put it that way, I can feel his love inside of me feeling his presence like he's sitting in the room i i don't actually have that experience i can feel him in my body and i can feel the love in my body but how he manifests himself is the things he says that are occurring inside my mind but are definitely channeled because they're things that i never dreamed of thought of imagined and they're said in his way of communicating not in mine so what i get from him is is communication, but I do feel him physically. That's, I guess, the answer I was looking for in that love. No one can take that away. What kind of things did he talk about? Did he tell you about the spirit world, what he's doing, what life's about? That yes. World? Over time, he shared all of that with me. And he's decided that he's going to write certain books. And he's, he's, he set out to write a book, Luminous Landscape of the Afterlife, which is really uh, helping people with the fear of death and telling them exactly what is out there, what to expect, what that afterlife looks like and feels, and also why we leave it to come here. So he outlined the book in about five minutes. And then over time, basically, I channeled all of his, all of, it's all from him. So what does he say? There, the afterlife is, there are components to it. The first thing that happens after we die is we end up in, he calls the landing place. 
and it's just adjacent to the spirit world. And in the landing place, the main function of that spot is to get used to being in a non-physical, having a non-physical experience. We see it 360 degrees, not just straight ahead. We are hearing things telepathically. We move by intention, but not by muscle motions. And this landing place is often familiar in some ways. It's, it's, a, it's a setting that we, we might have known in our lives, uh, but it also has a surreal quality, all heightened colors and so forth. Very, very beautiful. And it's there we meet guides and some of the, some of the per- important souls, perhaps uh, from our soul group who come to greet us. And that's a place we're getting used to this not being physical anymore. But it's also a place where guides evaluate our readiness to enter the spirit world. If we have a lot of intense residual emotions from the sort of unfinished issues in our life that are, that are really strong and, and overwhelming, a lot of fear or a lot of anger, we'll go to ancillary places where bardos, where where we work on that before we can enter the spiritual world. You can't enter the spirit world with intense negative emotions. And so there's sometimes a pausing that goes on and certain healing processes that have to happen before the soul is ready to fully enter the afterlife. The sort of sorting out is done in this ante room, in the landing place. And so once we enter the spirit world, the very first stop is where we we do the life review, as many people have talked about that. Uh, Jordan describes it, and I've had a little bit of the experience also when I've done the life between life regressions. Uh, it's a very powerful experience. And in that experience, we experience everything we've done, every choice we've made from our own perspective, but also from the perspective of the person who was affected by that choice or that behavior. So we're experiencing it both ways. And on top of that, not only do we experience it as that person experienced it at the moment, but over time, how it impacted them uh, in, in terms of move, moving forward in their life, how what we did impacted and affected them. And, and we're going through every single significant choice or, uh, that we made in our lives and observing its effect on ourselves, on, on others over time, longitudinally. So it's a very powerful process. It takes a while. We're supported by guides, and we do a tremendous amount of learning in this process. It's just, it's huge. It's a monumental re-experiencing of life from all perspectives. Then there are other steps that we can see in the afterlife, but fairly soon we reunite with our soul group. And as I think many people are aware, the soul group it's basically our family. It's our spiritual family. And there's anywhere between, oh, I don't know, six and 20 or so souls in each group. And then there are a lot of adjacent soul groups that connect to our own. We're not only involved with our own soul group. It, you could think of it like a neighborhood. The soul group lives in one house and they're with this little family together. And then there are houses that are next door and across the street and down the street. And these are all adjacent soul groups with whom we often have very significant and powerful connections of love and with whom we reincarnate typically. We often reincarnate uh, with our own soul group at the same time, the same place in in various relationships, but then others from adjacent groups will will be part of our incarnational existence. So we return to our family and to our neighborhood, essentially. And in the soul group, initially, there's just a big celebration. And in the afterlife, there's a lot of fun. I just want to mention that, that there's music, there's games, there's partying, literally partying, where people get together and just enjoy the love of each other and catch up and communicate. There's a lot of things that we do in the afterlife that are really pleasurable and recreational. And we do that in our soul group as well. There's a particular soul group that Jordan is in. They call it the farm because when in the afterlife, you can create images. Uh, and so whatever you actually think or imagine, you can create that image in such a way that it has a kind of a, a certain reality. And so that particular soul group has created a, a house that looks like a farmhouse. And for that reason, they call their little group the farm. And of course, there's a celebration. There's a re-engagement. Now, I just wanted to say something that might be of interest. 
part of our soul energy always stays in the afterlife. It always stays. So we are always present in our soul group. We are always present in the afterlife, even though we incarnate. And so when we incarnate, part of our soul energy enters a body, but part of our soul energy always remains in the afterlife. So we reunite with the part of our energy that has always been there. It's a more full and vibrant energy because now all of our energy is in one place, but it is also an opportunity now to do more learning. So a lot of what we do in addition to having fun is we engage in a lot of learning. There are guides who are specialty teachers that come in to our soul group and offer lessons about all manner of things. But we also engage in learning in other ways. One of the big things we do is we visit the Akashic Record as part of our learning process in the afterlife. And the Akashic Record, as I'm sure many know, you could think of it as a gigantic library. And in it is contained everything that's ever happened. <laughs> it's everything that's ever happened, particularly everything that's ever happened to any conscious entity, a conscious soul. And a lot of the Akashic Record also involves incarnations and what each soul did in the incarnation on many, many countless planets, because we incarnate on many, many different planets, Earth being one of the more difficult ones. So we do a lot of studying of that. And part of that is not just as, as studying the life we live, but also the life we might have lived. So we can actually, in the Akashic Record, we can look at, what if I decided something else? And then a, a chapter opens, and we can now see the outcome of what that would have looked like had we made that other choice. And there's a lot of learning that comes from that. And we can do the same thing with other souls. We can go back and, and, and take a look at Abraham Lincoln and see, okay, what would have happened if he didn't sign the Emancipation Proclamation? What would have been the outcome? We could have seen, we could, we could study that. So we're studying outcomes. We're studying what happens when you do X and Y and Z. And there's so much learning there. So it's not just what I did, but what I might have done or choices that were potential but never made. So it's a beautiful opportunity. And when we certainly close up the record, that chapter becomes null. It's not like a parallel universe. It's just a possible universe that exists just as long as we were observing it and learning from it. And then close it, it goes back into kind of a void state. That's incredible. Wow. (laughs) I wanted to ask, because Jordan never said, Dad, I know you're going through pain. This is the point of being there on earth. I think that's the greatest gift he's given me, is a sense of our purpose here. Why do we come to this place that's so painful, where we go through such struggle? And I think a lot of people feel like pain is a bad thing. It's like a sign of failure. It's like something we've done wrong. We shouldn't have pain. But in fact, we come to a physical world, enter a body that has a nervous system, so that we can actually encounter pain. And so why would we do that? (laughs) What is the point of, of pain? What Jordan says is that We incarnate in order to learn how to love in the face of pain. That's the main task we have here. We are learning how to love. See, in the spirit world, love exists without qualification. We just exist in a state of love. Love is essentially the the air that we breathe in the spirit world, and it's what connects all of us. But we incarnate to learn how to love intentionally, meaning how to love in the face of obstacles and pushback from the world we live in. Just maybe a silly example would be the parent who comes home is exhausted and is worn out and their kid is upset by something and needs some help with their homework and so forth. We have to love in the face of the pain, of the tiredness. Maybe we had a bad day at work, we're feeling anxious in the face of the anxiety. Maybe we're upset with our kid because they've been misbehaving. And so we have to love in the face of that anger or irritation. So that's what love is about. That's what we're learning here, how to love in the face of these obstacles, in the face of the pain. And the pain is teaching us how to love. It's teaching us how to love. In the spirit world, there is no pain. And love is effortless. But we have to learn how to love intentionally. And that's what we come here to do. 
And the last thing I'll say, just another comment here, is that everything we're learning, we come here to learn, and everything we're learning, we're uploading to all. So not only are we learning it as individual souls, but our mission here is to keep teaching all, is to give all everything that we've learned and it upload it. And so the mission of learning to love in the face of pain and everything else that we learn about this existence is given to all and all continues to grow and develop and evolve. Now, some people think that God is perfect and it doesn't evolve and doesn't grow. That's not at all true, according to Jordan. God is evolving. God, all of consciousness, is evolving, growing, and continually learning. And the means by which most of God's learning occurs is us. Incarnating in physical worlds and all the things we learn become part of the knowledge of God. I wanted to ask you about God. A lot of people I've interviewed have had near-death experiences, and they've seen whoever the person is from their own religion. Some people just feel this incredible light, and it's this unconditional love. Can you talk a little bit more through Jordan about this unconditional love, this light, this God? Yeah. It's the best word yeah. of it. Well, the best way I could describe it is that all, I've heard it use the word all, actually, because God is a kind of a limited word. So like we have this picture of some little guy in a white beard sitting in, on, a, on a big gold encrusted chair or something. And that's not what it is. All is all of us. We are all God. Every single conscious entity is part of all and is part of God. And that's why when we learn something, God learns something. That's because we're, we are part of it. And so um, when you talk about, you know, feeling the love of God and feeling the love and, and connection to God, what we're talking about is oneness. We're talking about feeling the love of all because we're all connected with love that's what holds us that's what holds god together that's what holds all consciousness together and in fact everything that consciousness creates all, all the worlds all, all the physical everything is held together with the gravity of love so when we're feeling the love of god we're feeling that oneness that deep connection to all and the, the love that holds it all together holds all of us together and unites us and connects us as one so it's a little different than, in my understanding from Jordan, it's a little different from God as an entity, personality that showers love out. But in Jordan's understanding, what he's taught me is that we are all God, and the love we experience is the love of connectedness to all and everything that exists. And that, that love is something shared as opposed to showered on us, if that makes sense. It's something that we all share and experience together as opposed to an entity showers us with love. Thank you for that. I want to read just a few sentences that I read in your book because it deals with doubt. You wrote, I'm exhausted. I blow out the candle. I want to believe everything I've heard, but I hate self-deception. It's a response I inherited from my father, a man who despised the ways people lie to themselves to justify their needs and actions. But suddenly it's clear I will have to live with that remembered content in order to keep listening. If I want to open the channel so my boy can talk to me, then I'll also have to live with the doubt, perhaps even ridicule. Matt, so many people, we doubt our own thoughts. We worry about what other people have to say about what we're doing. What would you say that helped you move through that, you know what, I've got a backbone to share this. This is reality and to push through that doubt. Yeah, I think that what you said is really important about pushing through because it's not a matter of certainty. And actually, some people, clients of mine that I've taught how to channel and have resisted because they say, I'm only going to channel if I have no doubt, if I have certainty. And then they don't. They don't channel, even though they could, even though they have, because they are insisting on certainty in order to reach out across the veil and reach the loved ones on the other side. So if we're going to say, I have to have uncertainty to do this, then most of us will not be able to do it. But it's just what you said. It's pushing through the doubt. And doubt shows up for me still. I have moments where the thought occurs to me, is this real? Or 
So something Jordan says makes me wonder, what did you just say? Does that make sense? And, and oftentimes, even just starting the process, I have to start with the awareness that I have fear that something might happen that might lead me to believe that it's not true. So that doubt is there. I've been doing this now for 15 years, and I would say the doubt has diminished somewhat, but it still shows up. And so every time I start, I usually channel with Jordan once a week. Every time I start to channel, I can feel a little of that edge of anxiety that, uh uh-oh, what if something happens here that makes me wonder if this is true? And there's a little bit of doubt. And so I have to push through it because my biggest value is the love between Jordan and myself and to enact that and be part of that and engage with him with love. That's my biggest value. And I have to do that, even though sometimes there's some doubt. It's so tough being human. I tell you, we all know this. We have this voice in our head that's not our biggest champion. I know sometimes there's that divine guidance and that self with the big S, our soul self. But why do we believe the voice of this negativity when we look in the mirror and mine shows the extra pounds and the gray hairs and all that? It is not my best friend, yet we believe it for so many other things. So push through that doubt. I love that. I do. Remember when I said love in the face of pain? Mm -hmm. See, if we're going to engage in a loving way with the souls on the other side and maintain that relationship and send love back and forth, we have to do it in the face of pain here. And the pain is doubt and uncertainty. And the pain is missing that person and grieving. And that when we try to make contact, it, it brings up the grief. So this is another example. In this case, it's loving across the veil. But we have to here, we have to do it in the face of pain. And doubt is one of those difficult things. Agreed. If you wouldn't mind, share some tools about how we can channel, as you call it, with our loved ones. Because Matt, who's listening and watching right now, could be experiencing some of the worst grief imaginable. And we want to believe How would we start? If you wouldn't mind, we'd love to learn. Yeah. There was one other thing I wanted to say is about God and and the afterlife. There is no judgment in the afterlife. God doesn't judge or that all doesn't judge. This whole idea that we have to live this life and we're going to be judged at the end of it and if we're bad, we go to hell and then we're good to go to heaven. It's completely false. And Jordan has just said that over and over and over again. It's false. There is no judgment. In the afterlife, all we do is go there and learn from the life we just lived. We're not judged. We're not ridiculed. We're not examined. We're not turned back because of things we did. So I just want to really emphasize that, that that's one of the other really important things about the afterlife. It's a place of love and zero judgment. And there are no places where people will go and suffer. Okay, how how do I channel? I'm sorry for that little digression, but it's perfect. We needed to hear it. So just, I would encourage people to just select a a place that you feel safe and secure. I actually usually channel right here in this room, right at this desk. It's my childhood desk that my folks gave me when I was 11. Find something that makes you a place that you feel safe and, and set that up as a kind of a ritual for where you'll channel. Then you need to clarify the spiritual address of where you're sending your communications to the afterlife. You can just be aware of the soul you're trying to communicate. By the way, you can channel yourself. You can channel your own soul energy in the afterlife. And that could be an address you send communications. You can channel to guides. And so anyway, just be clear on the address. Who is it? What entity are you are you seeking to communicate with? Uh, I think it's sometimes it's very helpful in terms of communicating to souls who, who we knew in, in life and have died is to have a little talisman, something that connects us to them, a physical object, something that maybe they gave, gave us or something that belonged to them. I use Jordan. I, I use actually his uh, this business card that he had that says Jordan McKay, that he's CEO of Omega Technologies. There was no Omega Technology. <laughs> he used this to get into trade shows when he was in high school. But I keep the card because it just reminds me of his humor and just the quality of a person, he a creative person. And that's my talisman. But you find one of your own and get something that connects you to that person in a physical way. It really is helpful for eye fixation. Just use a candle. 
just so, so, so something that holds your, your attention. You can look at it, but it could be anything. It could be a mandala or some sort of, I don't know, sea polished stone or a Celtic knot, whatever. But find something you can put your attention on. And then take a breath. And as you exhale, now we're going to go into kind of a symbol of a Vipassana meditation. As you exhale, just form the intention to open the channel. Bring all attention down to the diaphragm. Focus on the diaphragm. It's the center of breath, center of life. After, and I, on each out breath, count. So the first out breath, one. The second out breath, two, three, four. Keep counting to 10. If you're starting to feel receptive and open, you can start moving into channeling. If not, do another round of 10. So it's, it's just a simple meditation where we attend to the breath. When there's a thought that comes up, let the thought go, go back to the breath and just count each out breath, each out breath, one, two, three, letting go of thoughts and returning to the breath. So it's very, very simple meditation. And it's okay when thoughts show up, but just lay, leave the thought as soon as you notice it and get back to the breath. So that, that gets us into a, a kind of a receptive state. And then meanwhile, while you're doing the meditation, just keep your eyes fixed on the candle. What Ralph taught me was this little div divination to add to this. And what you do is you visualize an orb just above your head, maybe six inches above your head, color the sun, and just visualize it there, and then see it elongating into a tube-like connection to the soul you're trying to reach. And this is the channel opening. You visualize the orb, and now we just visualize the channel opening all the way to that soul. And in fact, that's exactly what happens because every soul in the afterlife who we love is just a thought away. As soon as we think about them, it opens the channel. And so the channel is opening as we are thinking about with love, we're thinking about that soul that we want to connect to. And so the channel is now open. And what I actually uh, re I think is really important is to make sure the, the communications are written down. So get a notebook or whatever, but you have to have paper and have a writing implement. And write your question down. Write your first question down. And then wait. The answer will show up in your mind, but the answer is being channeled or it's being communicated telepathically. So just wait. And it can come in different ways. Sometimes it comes as a big download, just a huge download. It doesn't even have words, just knowing. Sometimes it, it comes as, as an image or a picture. Sometimes it comes as a few distinct words, very succinct. Sometimes it comes as a phrase, and then you have to wait for the phrase to turn into a whole sentence, and then you may wait a little bit for the next sentence, and the next sentence, sometimes it comes slowly. So it comes in all different ways, and it's okay. Every way is fine. If it comes as a picture or just knowing, then you have to find words to describe the knowing or the picture. But in every case, write down what you get, whether it's a, just a few words, very, very compressed information, or it, in some cases, it's many, many sentences. And just stay with it until it, it stops. Stay with it until the communication stops. And then you write down the next question. And the other thing is the act of writing, watching the, the ink on the page is part of channeling because it actually puts us in a very receptive state. Literally watching the ink form on the page puts us in a very receptive state. So that's why it's so important, in my view, to write down the questions, and the answers that come down. The other reason you want to write down the answers is you want to have a record to look back on later. I have lots of things that Jordan has said to me, and I'll go back years later, just read them and I go, oh my God, I forgot that. And that's important. And that actually happens to me all the time. So having the record helps preserve the learning that you're getting. And you can ask anything. You can ask how that soul is, what they're doing. I, at one point, I asked Jordan if he'd incarnated. He had incarnated as a little girl. And he could tell me some things about that life if I was curious. But you can ask about what's happening with the soul right now, what they're learning in the afterlife. Jordan's talked a lot about that. He's learning a lot about how to influence people, how to influence people to see things in new ways. Also, you can ask about what is going on up there? What is the afterlife like? Also, you can ask advice for your own life. These souls are very wise. Every soul has had many, many lives. And they have the benefit of wisdom that we've forgotten when we come here. We leave that behind as part of the amnesia of life. So they have all this wisdom. So we can ask their advice. I asked Jordan about advice about everything, about his sister. How should I respond to this or that? I ask him work problems. 
I ask his advice while I'm doing a, a psychotherapy session. I'm feeling stuck. What do, what do I do now? And he speaks up. And usually it's something that didn't occur to me. And so you can ask for advice. We can ask for the nature of reality. We can help us form a, a, a new or a, a more accurate cosmology of how things really are and why we're here. And we can ask about them and what's going on for them. I think it is important, though, in, in these communications to convey love to that soul, to send them love in whatever form, because they need our love just like we need their love. It enhances their existence. So sending love, I think, is an important part of channeling when we're channeling loved ones up on the other side. So that's basically it. It's pretty much as simple as that. And after a period of silence, when you finish one question, you can just write another one down couple of things that came to mind. One, I think it's great writing it down because I know if I want to talk to my dad, I'll start, hey, dad. And then all of a sudden it's, oh, what are we going to have for dinner tonight? Exactly. A lot of distractions. For yes, that's a good yeah. point. Yeah. So we're writing it down. When Mr. or Mrs. Doubt does creep in, though, something comes out of the pen and the mind starts to analyze and think, oh, that's crazy. I just made it up. Do we go back to the candle? Do we go back to taking a few breaths? Thank you, Doubt, for sharing, but we're going to keep going with this. Push through that? Yeah, I just keep going. Just keep going. Sometimes he says something. Jordan says a lot of things to me that haven't occurred to me before, which is one of the ways I I feel clear about the authenticity of of this communication. But I sometimes you'll say something and I'll go, what what is that? But I just keep going. I just stay with the process. I ask the next question or I ask him to clarify it or I'll even mention to him, boy, I'm feeling a lot of uncertainty. And so he'll just respond to that in some way. So I bring it into the conversation, but I I think it's important to just keep going. Don't give up. When doubt shows up, don't stop. Stay with it. I remember when I wrote my book, I had a writing coach And she says, just let it all flow. Let it all flow. The time to analyze it is after, after you got your stories out. And I think too, when we do the channel and writing, don't write a sentence and read a sentence, write a sentence, read a sentence, maybe just be in that flow, be open and experiment with it. I also think, Matt, that it's important. uh, I know you, you say you work with Jordan every week. There's so many people, and myself included, we want immediate results. We want maybe the lights to flicker on and off or something so obvious. It takes something from us, I think. It's not that they can't give us good signs, because they can, but to open up that relationship and keep it going. So would it make sense to make a date with our loved ones and keep that journal? And today's date is such and such. How often did you channel with Jordan? When you started, I can't remember. I would channel with him fairly often, but I it might have been about the same interval now as once a week. I would say, and so over the course of fifteen years, I've had hundreds of communications, and I've you know, been so blessed to hear from him. And so I don't think there's any rule about this, but I do think that people should try to do it often enough that they stay connected. It's the same thing when you're any loved one. You have to talk to them periodically. And that's what feeds the relationship. And you talk to them, you connect, you, you find out what's going on with them. They find out what's going on with you. And in, through that process, love flows between you. And I think it's exactly the same thing with loved ones in the afterlife. And Jordan has been so clear about this. I, mean, I guess I want to say this, that relationships always live. It doesn't matter if that person died. The relationship lives. That person is just a thought away. They love us, and the love is still living, still active, still flourishing. And and that's true regardless of whether we connect to them or not, whether we channel or not. But when we channel, we get to act on that love ourselves, and we, we get to bathe in the love. We get to feel the love, which is such a beautiful thing. So that's one of the things that is so wonderful for me there it doesn't happen every time i channel but there are moments when i just feel jordan's love all through me and i feel my love for him inside my body and it's just such a beautiful moment and 
And that's one of the rewards of channeling is feeling that love as an active living experience. Beautiful words. I know personally, grief can come on like waves and all the investigating I've done really has helped with the grief, but the grief is still there. So if we're in one of those waves of grief, do we wait till another time to do it, push through it, include our loved one in it? Any words on grief? All emotions are waves. And interestingly, there's some research that shows the average emotion lasts less than seven minutes, even grief itself. Now, there'll be another wave, but all emotions come as waves and to not be afraid of them. So when that wave comes, allow it to ride it. And it's also, you mentioned one choice we have when that grief shows up is to turn it into communication, to, to open the channel during a period of grief. And I think sometimes there's, there's complicated things about grief. And sometimes grief actually blocks the channel. So people are waiting for loved ones to show up or, or, or appear to them or give them a sign. And their grief is so powerful, it kind of blocks the channel uh, and the loved one can't get through. But also, paradoxically, if you deliberately open the channel during grief, I think it can make it, the communications more intense, more beautiful in some ways, because now we're just not conveying words. We're conveying our deepest feelings, our love on the deepest level. So the grief actually is an opportunity to open the channel with great power and truthfulness. And the two things here, one is don't be afraid of the wave. Let the wave come. See, people are afraid of grief because they think it's a model. Oh, the grief's going to come. It's going to crush me. And down I go. I, I won't be able to survive. And, but it doesn't work like that. It's just a wave. And a wave subsides. And after a period of time, there'll be another wave. Uh, the longer out we go be, after the person's death, usually the waves are, are further apart. And sometimes they're a, a little less intense. But it's also possible. Years later, you can have a, a wave that goes right through the roof and yet and ride it and allow it. It just and don't be afraid of it. And that wave is actually an opportunity to connect. I, I just want to encourage people to allow the feeling. And if on some level, the feeling is beautiful because what makes grief so intense is the love. And so when we allow the grief, we're also allowing the love. And I guess I want to encourage people to do that. And the last thing I will say about grief is I've learned, if I could put it that way, to grieve Jordan's physical absence. He'd be 39 now. I don't get to see him grow up. I don't get to see him have a family. I mean, he was 23 when he died. There's not going to be a family. His girlfriend, when he died, has a new partner and has a kid. And I won't get to have any of that or get to observe any of that or be part of any of that. And Jordan in this life doesn't get to have that. And so I, ha- I can have grief about his physical absence. But I don't have grief about he's gone. And I don't have grief about the love I have for him has nowhere to go or the love he has for me I can't receive. That is not part of the grief. The grief is just limited to, oh, his physical presence is not here. But Jordan is here. Jordan is with me. And he says that to me all the time. Bill Teary, as I say it, all the time he's telling me, I am with you. I am with you. And he is. So the grief is limited when we start really communicating and connecting, limited to just the loss of that physical manifestation of that soul. Beautiful words. Wow. I spoke with a mom, you may know her, Maria Pei, whose two sons were murdered by her ex-husband, and then he killed himself. And she said, when those waves of grief come, I think of a good memory with my boys. I think of that love, and then I start talking to them. So that's her way in. And it really touched my heart. Matt, any more words you wish to share while we're here today? Is there anything that's coming to mind? Jordan asked me to say, when I have an opportunity to tell a little bit about his story and us, is that he just says, remember, you will be received. You will be cared for. And you will be loved when you die. He says, the dark door will open and the light of love will take you. So you don't have to be afraid of death. And also, we don't have to be afraid of the impermanence here where loved ones appear to die. The dark door opens and the light of love has taken them in 
and will take us. Matt and Jordan, thank you so much for being our guest today. So enjoy being with you, Sandy. Oh, really incredible. And again, to our listeners or our viewers, the book is titled Seeking Jordan, How I Learned the Truth About Death and the Invisible Universe by Dr. Matthew McKay. And for our listener, thank you for taking the time to be here or our viewer as we are on all channels. As a reminder, all past episodes can be found at wedontdie.com. Again, you can find medium classes there. You can find our Facebook group with over 7,000 fabulous members. And also two o'clock New York time every Sunday, you can find our inspirational service called the Sunday Gathering. There's music, little prayer, non-denominational, and there's a medium demonstration included in each and every one. And so there's been well over 800 loved ones that have come through. You get to feel just how close the love is. And they are part of our lives, one foot in our world and one foot in theirs. And we will see them again. That's all at wedontdie.com. So in closing, my name is Sandra Champlain. I'm always so happy to be your host on We Don't Die Radio. I also do believe that life is an education for the soul and that your life here on earth is important. It's about those emotions. It's about those experiences, embracing the fear and the tough times and sending it love. And we're constantly surrounded by love. So I really want to thank you for listening or for watching, and we'll see you again soon.